Well, good afternoon, everybody, both here in our uh, offices at Vilupumira here in Foligno, for all the people who are present here, both the partners and our guests, a very warm welcome to this workshop. And also to all the people who are connected online and who are following the, the, this, this panel on COVID safe events and festivals. This is part of our uh, share, Interact Europe share project, but more about this later. And uh, I'm going to leave the floor immediate, immediately to our president of Svilup Umbria, sole administrator, Mrs. Michela Schupa, for a welcoming address to all of you. Good afternoon. I am Michela Schurpa, the CEO of Svilup Umbria, and I am very, very happy that it is my pleasure to welcome you today in this discussion of good practice for COVID safe events. Svilup Umbria is the economic development agency working to support the Umbria region, its municipalities, and its many small businesses to grow and operate sustainably, to innovate, and to cooperate at the local and national inter and international levels. Svilup Umbria's mission is to support internationalization processes of Umbria businesses, especially SMEs, to carry out territorial marketing and promotion to attract investment and talents in Umbria to support innovation and technology transfer to manage and evaluate the region's real estate holdings and to support the region in tourism promotion. According to regional and European priorities, our activities are now enriched by further specialized support services in order to help local SMEs make the transition to environmental and social sustainability, digitalization and resilience. Personally, I have also recently reinforced the agency capacity to participate directly in European cooperation projects such as SHARE, and to make such expertise available to our municipalities, businesses and citizens interested in accessing direct and indirect EU funding. To perform all these tasks, Svilop Umbria employs a professional staff that I thank <laughs> with experience and expertise in a range of different economic sectors and cooperates with public and private entities. Our day-to-day -day work includes also running business incubators in the city of Terni and in Foligno, where we are today serving as territorial partner for the Enterprise Europe Network and providing specific services to help startups flourish. Our mission now also focuses on post-pandemic economic recovery, revitalization and resilience. Svilup Umbria and the regional administration are implementing measures to support enterprises and lo local government to emerge from a very difficult time. These are the goals that the SHARE project too, which brings together peers from across Europe to seek ideas and solution for today's complex challenges. The COVID crisis started almost two years ago now, and we are here together to exchange experiences about how cultural events and festivals have managed to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances. Speakers today include representative from a major music festival and from two important 
festivals that celebrate literature. Festivals such as those entertain and stimulate residents and attract visitors, and they are very good for regional economic development. That is why keeping event accessible and sustainable, even in challenging times, is very important. I am very interested to discover with you the lesson less learned from COVID safe events here in our own COVID safe event. My thanks to the speakers who will share their expertise with us and to everyone is joining is joining us online, especially to you who have come from Romania, Croatia, Spain and England to be here. I wish everyone a very beneficial work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, okay. Thank you very much indeed. I must say that I'm uh, very happy uh, to have a, a CEO that actually has invested so much energy and efforts in improving our work in European cooperation projects. Uh, something that we've been uh, devoting our time before, but even more so now, thanks to this uh, uh, increase in support. Um, I now leave the floor to the uh, region, Region Umbria is actually the majority share, shareholder of the Umbria and our managing authority as well. Um, instead of Mr. Paolo Reboani, who's unfortunately uh, is dealing with a very serious family issue, we have uh, Valeria Covarelli, uh, a friend and a colleague who's responsible for European cooperation, territorial cooperation for the region Umbria to, um, uh, uh, to uh, give us a few words from, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the region. Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Chiara. I hope you hear me. And good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, Umbria is actively involved in the European cooperation uh, and uh, first of all, we are the national contact point of Interreg Europe in Italy. And uh, so we are promoting the program and the services uh, to public authorities and participants. And uh, we are also representing Italy on the steering committee. Uh, in, second word, in, second, in a second moment, the region is also the managing authority for this project. Uh, and four is also uh, a key stakeholder. Then we participate uh, directly uh, in the European Founded Cooperation Project, they included uh, as a lead partner of the Interreg European project called CLAY, running through 2023. Uh, CLAY focuses uh, on improving the competitiveness uh, uh, of a small and medium enterprise in the artistic, artistic ceramic sector. Uh, which is a significant uh, cultural heritage tradition here in our partner, partner territories. And, mm, uh, finally, finally uh, our region's office in Brussels uh, supports uh, Umbrian uh, businesses and municipalities in uh, identifying uh, calls for research programs uh, founded by uh, Horizon Europe, but also other programs like uh, Creative Europe and so on. Uh, with Bruxelles offices and the Philippines, we are also organizing a webinar to provide detailed information to Umbrian small and medium enterprises and uh, uh, research with speakers from the European Commission. Uh, so, for me, it's a real an honor uh, to welcome today's speakers and audience to the event. And uh, uh, thank you, you, thank you all of you for being here. And uh, the best wishes from Mr. Reboan and for myself uh, for the event. So I, I, now I'm listening to, to you, and I'm very, um, I'm very curious to listen what new you are telling us uh, about this uh, this project. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Valeria. I see it is also thanks to the region, this department, and also the help and support from the National Contact Point for Interreg Europe that we were able to carry out so many projects. So it is uh, an unfailing support from our own managing authority. Um, and now, in uh, closing this first round of, uh, of, um, of uh, addresses and presentations, I leave uh, the to Mia Itanen, representing the, representing the Joint Secretariat of the Interreg Europe Pro Program. She's a senior communication officer, but also she's the communication officer for our project share. We've been working with her for many years, and she's been great in supporting us and helping us to promote our project. Mia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and a very warm welcome on my behalf as well. I'm very happy to be part of this event. and. I also want to congratulate you for choosing such a relevant and timely topic because finding solutions for organizing safe and sustainable events is definitely something that we can all learn each other from and share experiences on. I maybe want to start going a little bit into the topic of the day with some reflections from, from our side as a program. Intro Europe being a pan-European program with partners um, in 30 different countries, um, and, and a program that seeks to bring people together so that they can share experiences and, and find those solutions together and get inspired by each other. Well, for us, a uh, situation such as the pandemic has definitely been a massive change in how we operate. We have heavily relied on events and, and creating those opportunities to bring people together. And facing, facing the crisis during the past two years has, has forced us to reconsider how we do that. Um, as a program, we have been lucky because having digital events has been a part of our strategy already before COVID. So we have done hybrid events. We have organized occasions um, for people to meet online. We have used webinars and other tools to, to disseminate information. And we've already seen the benefits of, of how we can use that to reach more people and to reach new audiences. But still, it has been a very, very challenging time for us as well as a program, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the experiences from the panel later today, hoping to also maybe get some ideas for, for us and our activities. Um, what we have seen, of course, is that the online tools can, can bring new opportunities and, and bring new kinds of ways to reach out to people, but we very dearly miss the opportunities to really meet face to face and have those genuine exchanges and and interactions between people because at the end of the day that's that's very difficult to replicate anywhere else than than face to face having this event as a hybrid session today is very nice so for those of you in italy i hope you make the most of the occasion and i hope we'll get many more of those chances later on as well um, what I would be very, very keen to hear from you based on your experiences is what have we learned in these two years? What are those things that we can use and continue to make use of um, as we move past the pandemic gradually and resume with events? I don't think we necessarily need to go back to doing things the way we used to, but really look for those, those new ideas and see what helps. For example, for us as a program, um, being forced to do everything online also helped us to realize that doing online events and, and using those digital channels before and after the main event itself can be a very, very efficient tool to um, foster communities and build engagement and, and have a more committed audiences. And we have actually had some of our biggest events as a program during the past two years. So. It has been very, very challenging, and we are still testing new solutions and finding new approaches, but it hasn't been all bad. So also picking up some of those um, lessons learned in the positive sense as well is very important. Um, as said, I'm very, very much looking forward to hearing what the panel has to share. So, so I'm very keen to, to move to that. Before that, maybe one quick reminder or announcement to everyone following us today. Um, Intrad Europe as a program is, of course, all about exchanging experiences and sharing solutions and good practices. We hope to continue to do that also in the upcoming programming period and in the new, new program. And we are just about to launch our first call for project proposals. To do that, we have an event of our own coming up very soon on the 5th of April. We will launch the first call and, and tell more about how cooperation and these type of exchanges will, can, will work in the future. So I would like to invite you all to join us in that event as well. But 
that's all from from my side. I'm very happy to be here and very much looking forward to the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia. You, we, we, we hope to see you in person in some of our future meetings, uh, since you couldn't join us uh, today. And uh, yeah, we, you have asked the key questions during your presentation. You actually did a lot of uh, a lot of talking about what we're going to discuss later on. The first one being, what have we learned from this experience? And this is probably the the most uh, important topic we were going to discuss today, hoping to find a solution or at least a preliminary solution or answer to that question today. Uh, before I leave the floor to the panelists, a brief description of what we're doing, why we're dealing with COVID safe events now in this phase of our share project. Our project actually had a first phase ending in 2020, who was devoted to finding a sustainable solution for cultural heritage in uh, uh, cities across Europe. And we ended that phase with action plans for each region dealing with uh, the sustainability issues while uh, basing our uh, approaches to uh, the lessons learned in our um, the, uh, sharing of experiences during our work. Um, the Interreg Europe program awarded our additional funds for uh, an um, integration of the work we've done before um, based on the experience of COVID, especially resilience during the COVID pandemics and as me has, uh, has, uh, has reminded us also what we can learn from this and take uh, away from uh, as a positive experience for the future. Uh, so what we're doing in uh, SHARE during this new year, additional year of activities, concentrating on, on how, how our cultural heritage as, uh, assets, both material and immaterial, have dealt with the many waves of the pandemics over the past two years. Uh, the partners have been uh, working on uh, different kind of cultural heritage, being them uh, events, uh, festival such as uh, what we are going to listen to today here in Umbria but also museums archaeological sites churches and all those assets and uh, and uh, heritage that make our our you know cultural uh, identity identity throughout Europe uh, this uh, case study is in progress, is ongoing. We already have some, some results, but it's not going to be completed until uh, the end of this, uh, this year. So by, by the end of spring, we will have probably the final report. But it's also um, integrated by an, um, an online survey about travel behavior and behavior in terms of approaching cultural heritage during COVID. This online survey is a totally new uh, thing that we're doing. It, it has been devised by our advisory partner, the University of Greenwich in London, um, and is ongoing. We just launched the, the, the survey now. We're going to put up the link uh, later on so that everybody can also participate, as well as those we, who already res have started responding to the survey, but we would like to have a, you know, a, an enthusiastic response from more and more people. And um, what we're going to do today again is uh, discuss these preliminary findings and the way in which COVID has changed our behaviors, uh, behaviors toward uh, traveling. Um, this, uh, this event today, the, this panel, this workshop uh, was originally planned only for Umbria as a stakeholder meeting. So we have a lot of our own stakeholders participated to this event, both here and online. Municipalities and other events and festivals organizers couldn't join us in presence, but are here online. Um, and even though uh, cultural heritage is often associated and mostly managed by the public sector, it is also uh, integrated by the work of a lot of SMEs throughout Europe, especially uh, for uh, events and festivals. And it, it is for this reason that this panel, this workshop is in, included in the pan-European program uh, event that is the EU Industry Days as a local event. Um, so we'll also uh, would like to highlight this side of, uh, of our cultural heritage, the private sector and the SMEs who had, had to deal with the, with the pandemics. Um, uh, I remind everyone that, that you can ask questions at the end of the panel and uh, for those who are connected online, there will be a chat box where we collect all the questions that you may have and uh, then uh, reply afterwards. Um, I'll uh, 
without further ado, I think I'll uh, move on and uh, leave the floor to our first panel. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator and Andy Friars, who's a sustainability, a sustainability management consultant and expert, and also as a day job, is the sustainability director for the Hay Festival of um, in uh, in the UK. And uh, so I I really very much look forward not only to his uh, moderation of the panelists and uh, but also for some of your inputs on your own based on your own experience of how how to organize a festival during a pandemic. Um, and the first panel will uh, leave the floor to our two panelists uh, representing the two festivals we have investigated so far here in Umbria. Um, Mrs. Antonella Pinna, who's uh, representing the region of Umbria, uh, she's actually the, the manager for everything that has to do with culture here, but is also responsible for Umbria Libri, our uh, book festival and literature festival here in, uh, in, uh, in Umbria. So I'll, I'll invite Antonella to join us here. And uh, Claudia Galli, who's responsible for spon sponsorship, something that is very important for the private sector, I was just telling, for the Umbria Jazz Festival, one of our much beloved of the music festival here in Umbria. Uh, so please, Claudia, and uh, I'll leave you the floor along with, uh, with Andy uh, for this first round of, uh, of a debate about how your events dealt with COVID. Oh my God. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, and uh, thank you to our previous speakers. Uh, uh, Michaela, Valeria and Mia. Um, and thank you for joining us here online and live in the audience. Um, as Chiara said, my name is Andy Friars um, and uh, sustainability consultant, but also um, sustainability director at Hay Festival. Uh, and the, the way we're going to run this, this session uh, this, this is basically in, in the form of two panels. The first panel, we're going to focus on Umbria because that's where we are, makes sense. Um, and on the impacts of COVID on the, these two events. And then uh, we're going to uh, look in a similar way, uh, more internationally, to look at the, 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 the SHARE projects which have been operating across the, um, uh, 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 the last two years. I'll take this mask off. I think I'm allowed to when I'm speaking. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's the way we're going to do it. Uh, I'm, I'll talk a bit about Hay Festival when we come to the international section, so once we've once we've uh, dealt with um, uh, Antonella and uh, Claudia, uh, so uh, without any more, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going, to, uh, uh, Claudia. I'd like to start with maybe asking you first, just to respond to the sort of opening question. I, I want to look a little bit, go back in time to when that when COVID first properly hit. Uh, I can remember I was here in February of 2020 in this very seat, just <laughs> as we were just thinking this, it's not going to be that bad. What can possibly go wrong? And clearly, you know, the COVID hit and the first lockdown hit and all of a sudden, all those events which we were all planning yeah. suddenly had to change. So what was the impact on, on, on Umbria Jazz at that first moment? We can absolutely affirm that uh, Italy was the first European country to be really hit by COVID. And uh, uh, I must say that Fondazione Umbria Jazz uh, began uh, to put his, uh, all its employees in smart working even before the, the real lockdown uh, began. And I really never forget, uh, can forget uh, those, those first, uh, first weeks ever. Because, you know, we were astonished by everything was happening and uh, the number of deaths rising, uh, uh, the world completely stopped and in this sort of unattended, um, let me say, standby situation. And after these first weeks, uh, uh, we really began uh, all our, um, all, our um, all the, 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 the colleagues in Umbria Jets, what we can do. Because the idea that the music, let me, uh, allow me to, to use the, this word, uh, could stop uh, it was impossible to you know to stand and uh, and so uh, you know we we the first weeks uh, we thought about streaming we thought about what we can do without the presence of the public that it's 
the, the major, uh, the, the force that uh, uh, that um, give us uh, the force to to go on also uh, when uh, when times are difficult. So in this in that uh, first period uh, we worked at a um, marathon, a uh, piano marathon with some uh, very famous um, Italian uh, musicians. And we uh, um, released that streaming with the collaboration of Radio Monte Carlo on occasion of the uh, International Jazz Day. Meanwhile, began, um, we began to project uh, um, a web series called Jets Life. Um, that is about uh, uh, um, the day of a musician in tour. And this project uh, we are very proud of because it's not only about music, uh, but it's also about uh, uh, our territory because we, we have in the name Umbria and we are really attached to this, uh, this, uh, this region, this territory. So we, um, we work about uh, four different musicians or groups and we, uh, we told uh, um, their day in four different uh, um, cities in Umbria, uh, Perugia, uh, Gubbio, Orvieto and Castiglione del Lago. And the musician, we worked um, in the lockdown, but then we, uh, we make all the videos when the lockdown was, uh, was finished, of course. But it, it was something that um, it made us feel alive, you know. And so we, we make both, uh, both things, um, giving support to territory and uh, uh, telling people that music was continuing. Um, this video is uh, composed of two parts. The first one uh, tells the day, and then we have a link um, to, the, um, to the concert that I... I'm very proud uh, to, to tell that this concert has have been held in places in which um, usually concerts uh, cannot be held. I'm, I'm, it was uh, uh, Torre del Cassero in Perugia. It was uh, uh, in Orvieto outside uh, the dome uh, at dawn, two, two pianos, one in front of the other. It was a very beautiful atmosphere. Then we went to Castiglione del Lago, uh, to La Torre uh, above the lake, and uh, we made it outside the Anfiliato Romano in Gubbio. I, I just want to tell um, this story because uh, even if uh, we couldn't do what we do our best, we did not stop. It was really important for, uh, for all of us. Then in, in May, uh, as the lockdown stopped and uh, it seems that uh, things could be better, uh, we began to think uh, about the future. It was, uh, anyway, it was uh, clear that we couldn't, we couldn't uh, realize uh, a proper festival because, you know, there was um, social distancing, uh, distancing, there was uh, the ban of gathering. And, and uh, I don't know if any one of us have, uh, has never been at uh, Umbria Jazz, but the most part of our festival is about squares, free concerts. There is an, an atmosphere really magical, but this was not possible. So we try to understand uh, what to do because we want to stop, we want to do hope, we want to uh, uh, let a lot of people work again because you know uh, stopping events uh, does not mean that only musician stops there is all the um, hidden part you know uh, the, the crew uh, the manager um, there is a really big world under uh, a festival so we um, we or uh, we finally uh, decided to organize two events the first one was in July. It was a beautiful concert that we uh, we held in uh, Rettorato uh, dell'Università degli Studi di Perugia. Uh, the concert uh, was named uh, 243. Um, 
the musician were Paolo Fresu and Daniele Di Bonaventura. They, they played uh, above a tree in the Rettorato. Um, obviously, uh, the number of people was limited. There was dist uh, distancing among, uh, among the, uh, each other. But um, it was important. Uh, it was important also because this, uh, this concert uh, is linked to another very important part uh, of our festival. And I mean uh, the, the, the part um, involving, involving uh, sustainability. Um, but we can talk about it later. And then uh, since the, the, the festival uh, it's not possible to, to be held, also because the, 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 the most part of the uh, foreign artists that uh, we have booked for the festival has cancelled their tours, uh, also because of the, 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 the flight problems, and you know, and uh, so we decided to organize four days in August, uh, it was not a festival, but is um, really worth of the name of the festival. And these four days were organized in Piazza Quattro Novembre, besides, besides uh, the um, Fontana Maggiore. Uh, Piazza Quattro Novembre is uh, not only the real uh, heart of Perugia, but also, is also the heart of Umbria Jazz. Because we uh, began, um, Umbria Jazz began in uh, 1973, and since 1973, uh, we have always had a stage in Piazza Quattro Novembre. So uh, these, uh, these four days uh, uh, were really important because there was this link um, between the city and the festival. It was very difficult because, you know, there was uh, social distancing, there was a ban of gathering, so we, we put barriers uh, all around uh, the area uh, chosen for, uh, for the concert. Um, we, uh, we did not uh, open a ticket office. Uh, tickets were to buy only uh, online. Uh, there was, uh, so that we could also uh, eventually tracing the, 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 the people who, do, who bought the, the, the tickets. Um, um, and uh, there was also detailed instruction how, how to to uh, to be uh, to be uh, sure of safety measures. All the, the we have a, a really a big staff uh, to help people to understand, to help people uh, um, entry and exit. It was really a big big effort, but we I can now say we did it, and it was uh, it was hard, but we did it, and it was really a, a great success. Then what happened? Uh, some uh, you know uh, people. Um, were thinking that COVID uh, was uh, slowly um, go down. And then in autumn, we, have, uh, we had uh, just began our jazz club season in Perugia uh, when COVID uh, began to rise again and there was another lockdown. And we were obliged to, to cancel the, the winter edition the, on the festival that usually um, um, is held in Orvieto uh, between December, the, the last days of December and the first days of January. And it was, um, it was bad, really bad, because uh, we, we didn't expect it. Then uh, in, 19, uh, in, uh, in 2021, uh, thanks also to the, uh, a new system of modular restriction, and thanks also to the, the, the beginning of the vaccine campaign, uh, we were able to organize uh, the festival in July even though it was not the real festival, because as you all know, there was still uh, social distancing, there was still a ban of gathering. So we, we were obliged to cancel all the free concerts. And um, it was sad because as I, I, I told you um, first, uh, the free concert uh, and all the atmosphere that we can uh, um, experience in the, the center of Perugia is the really harder festival. Even though we organize uh, the concert in, in the, 
main stage of Umbria Jazz, that is in Arena Santa Giuliana, because in this, uh, in this way, uh, we um, have been able to um, adopt all the safety measures that uh, the government uh, was, uh, was uh, asking us. We were even the first uh, to adopt Green Pass, uh, because uh, Region Umbria uh, asked for it, uh, and we we did it. At, the, at, the, at, the, the, at first, the, the public was not so happy <laughs> of this, uh, you know, uh, further measure. But then uh, I think they that they realized that it was absolutely for for their safety, uh, and uh, the, the, we also organized a, an area uh, inside the arena. And we um, we made um, how to say in English? I know, a swap. Sorry, <laughs> a swap to all the staff, to all the crew, to all the artists, to everyone that was really connected with the festival, in order to avoid um, at least in the festival area that COVID could be um, a danger. Then uh, we did not stop because uh, you know since uh, um, we have begun to organize another uh, festival in spring in Terni uh, obviously we couldn't organize it in uh, 2020 and in 2021 because we were uh, in lockdown so uh, after the, the, the festival in July we began to think perhaps we can do it uh, we can do UJ we can in Terni in September and we did it. Uh, we made a four days festival um, with um, concerts uh, uh, on an outdoor stage, but we also um, have involved uh, uh, many indoor clubs. And it was a good success because uh, we made uh, a couple of sold out and we had a lot of publics uh, coming also um, from outside the region. And this is a big thing, you know, for uh, tourism territory. And it's a prize for what uh, what we do. Then uh, um, we come to UJ Winter uh, that we uh, were obliged to cancel uh, the previous year. And this year, uh, UJ Winter has been the first festival that uh, we have been able to organize at full capacity. We were worried because, you know, in December, COVID began to rise uh, up again and Omicron was really, you know, um, very bad for us. And uh, we were worried because uh, the festival was at full capacity. But once again, I can say the public uh, has surprised us because we have uh, all the, uh, almost all the concerts uh, held at Teatro Mancinelli sold out. And um, Orvieto was really full of people, and uh, it was really a great success. I I can say that I I this uh, uh, this experience has teach us that people is uh, um, you know is tired. Uh, people want to 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 begin to live normally again. But I think also that all the measures, all the safety measures that we uh, have uh, uh, taken in this long period, um, has people understand understand that they continue, can continue to 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 go to concert, to go to museum, to go to have a, a normal uh, normal life again. Now um, we are trying. We are we have already begun. We have a complete uh, program. To, to work on the next uh, festival in July. Uh, the program is complete. We are working on all the normal activities uh, we, we do during the festival, uh, working on sponsor. And I want to say also a word about sponsor because, you know, uh, when uh, uh, someone decides to invest, they expect uh, something back and one of the things that um, really has uh, made me happy during these two years that I can say that uh, our uh, our sponsor even if we couldn't do for them 
all the things that we are used to, they didn't abandon us. And this is really a great, great, uh, great thing. It's very important. It's, it, it's the, the proof that um, in, in some way we are all together, that uh, it's uh, the time, you know, for recovery, it's the time to rebuild. And uh, so, what to say? Finger crossed. Okay. That's um, uh, it's. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think from my experience, the the sponsors were in general very good. They didn't abandon us at Hay either. Um, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive uh, answer, um, Antonia. The did you find a similar um, experience? I mean, yours yours is a different event. Yours is you know, public funded. It's very much much more of a local audience. Yes. Um, uh, and also, it took place later, wasn't it? October rather than July. So, did you? How did did you find a similar kind of experience, or were you able to to learn from what some of the other people were doing? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, a few months more than uh, Umbria Gens uh, to. Uh, think about uh, what to do. Umbria Libri uh, normally takes place in October. Two uh, cities involved, Perugia at uh, the beginning and Terni at the end of the month. So uh, after a while, after March, after we had the calendar of the yeah. pandemic <laughs> before on, a, on our um, screen, and uh, we we had to to think uh, we had to plan uh, in uh, at the very last moment uh, after spring uh, had come uh, and uh, something was reopened uh, and uh, uh, during the summer thanks to the great support of Svilup Umbria that was uh, our partner in organize in organize uh, Umbria Libri uh, we wanted to so we did it in Perugia and uh, of course uh, after the first uh, the first moment uh, everything was getting worse in october so we had to plan uh, everything in a different manner of the president uh, the, the caprese uh, of the other years uh, we have to reduce uh, the public, the attendance, uh, um, of course, uh, sanitization and uh, every measures of uh, spacing, uh, social distancing between the people and uh, every safety precaution. And uh, an extremely strict uh, security plan uh, with the staff very concerned about uh, all the measures and we have to inform our public that uh, uh, we were going to make a reservation uh, uh, compulsory uh, so booking and uh, the rooms uh, that are normally uh, very uh, very crowded very full of people uh, uh, joining the authors and the publishers uh, were cut, were cut because of social distancing. You know, we Umbria Libri takes place uh, in the very center of Perugia, I say to the, our audience, in an ancient monastery. So the restriction were uh, so uh, also uh, for the for the nature of the location of the venue and. Uh, we had to think uh, out of the box, uh, as we, uh, as many of us in every situation during the pandemic. So uh, the meetings uh, in presence for a few uh, public uh, were streamed on the YouTube channel of uh, Umbria Libri. And so it was a, a measure very appreciated from our public because many people was restrained to go outside uh, even when the measures of uh, lockdown was uh, was uh, you know was stopped and uh, the main uh, 
effect of the, of the pandemic was uh, to the um, our fair book fair. We have uh, the stands of the publishers, a local publisher, one publisher that is uh, one of the uh, most interesting uh, thing in our uh, uh, manifest uh, in our event, Umbria Libri is uh, the point uh, of uh, to, to, for uh, uh, for publishers and authors, uh, uh, writers, and uh, the public who can have uh, exchanges between them. And uh, so we cut uh, with the fair. It, it, this was uh, replaced, uh, but uh, the virtual panels uh, with the QR code. Uh, um, and uh, this was uh, felt like a, a um, diminution as a lack of uh, uh, interest. In, but uh, so <laughs> it was, uh, was obligated. Siamo stati obbligati, non uh, wasn't. Uh, the situation was getting progressively worse uh, and uh, the second part of Umbria Libri, the event interni was uh, canceled because uh, of the measure, the national measure of uh, adopt the new lockdown. lockdown. In, 20, uh, in 2021, uh, last, uh, last autumn in October, with less stringent security measures, uh, the event was able uh, to be held uh, both in Perugia and in Terni. And uh, we increased the number of events uh, and uh, we have uh, the possibility the, uh, to have the fair with the stand uh, of the publishers. And uh, it was uh, a, a near, quite normal, quite normal, because uh, we had to, uh, the introduction of the Green Pass, uh, we have the security the, and the booking uh, of uh, the event, uh, like the, the previous year, space in mask and so on. But we are looking forward uh, the 22 <laughs> in a more optimistic uh, wave uh, and or the, we have some uh, some lessons learned, and uh, I think we uh, we are ready to to think uh, about a new event uh, more uh, inclusive and more attractive uh, for our public. You you say you you had, you streamed some of the events on YouTube. Mm. What sort of numbers did you get watching? Well, the number was. Um, half and half, uh, half in present uh, okay. in, the, in the average. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that uh, um, the, the, um, the events are still on the channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, freelance and have uh, as, a, as, a, as a patrimony yeah. of our uh, and manifestation. You never, you never streamed before. This was new. no, because the very right. first time, and it was a an organi uh, an organizing effort. Uh, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. really. I know. <laughs> it is. Mm. And did you? But we did. <laughs> you, so, and your the QR code which you had mm. to access it. Did you pay for the QR code, or was it still free? No, it was yeah. free because it was uh, the the mean to um, enter in the. In, in the part of the website of, of Umbria Libri and uh, to have the catalog of the publishers uh, or publishers and uh, the way to know how many of them were the comp uh, in, the, in the event, uh, how many of them had uh, a, a presentation of book uh, and so. And, uh, you know, after a, a first, uh, um, reaction, the publisher were and now are very, very interesting in, in this measure. It's another 
way for uh, for them to be uh, to be known yeah. uh, to enter in uh, contact uh, with the new public. Well, so you you have a you have a direct contact now to be able to yes. message in the future. Um, and Claudia, did did you charge for the things which you did online no, during the uh, it was all free. Absolutely, absolutely. But you, you normally charge, don't you, for apart no, from your, no, not no. your our uh, all our. Um, Streaming project are absolutely free. Right, okay. So that was a continuation yeah, of that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of your, we talked a bit about audience and about how, how they responded. How, have you found that's changed over the two years from when it first, when, when you first had lockdown? I think you both said the audience would work, we understand, of course, we'll do what we can. Has that changed as the pandemic has changed? Has the audience reaction changed? I think that the public of Umbria Jazz uh, has been really collaborative because, you know, we, uh, there was, you know, some bad mood, uh, especially when we were forced to cancel all the big concert in 2020 uh, because there, there was a really big program, program you know, <laughs> we were expected to to have uh, Lenny Kravitz, uh, it was a, there was a moment in <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our social <laughs> were uh, taken by assault that all these people. But then um, I can I can uh, I can I can tell that they were really co collaborative. We uh, obviously uh, have repaid uh, all the people who uh, asked for it. But I can also say that um, there were a lot of uh, other persons that uh, uh, have preferred not to be uh, repaid, but have preferred to, um, to choose a, a voucher mm -hmm. instead. And I think that it's uh, a great thing. Uh, in this period, another thing that we, we did is to increase uh, our uh, um, web and social activities. Uh, putting online a lot of uh, old photos, old concerts, and the public um, has had a, a great answer, really. And have you found the same sort of reaction? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I was listening. Uh, yes, has um, the been similarly supportive? Yes. No, uh, absolutely. Um, the first year, the, the 2020, was uh, was a shock mm -hmm. for everybody. So our public was uh, very, very caution, had caution to, to, to go to go out of our house. Uh, and uh, and the twin, so it, uh, it was uh, like uh, it's so so we are here. Right, okay. Good to be here, but this is not the real Umbria Libri. In the 2021, uh, it was a, a sort of liberation, a sort of this is a sign of back to normality. Yeah. Question mark. Yes, question. New, norma new, new normality. New, new normality. New normality. And uh, the occasion in October was. Uh, one of the first occasion, yes, it was the, 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 the summer with Umbria Jets, some other festival, but uh, in October was the first, uh, again, uh, the venue of meetings uh, to, to go out and uh, have uh, mm -hmm. uh, a little, um, to socialize with other people. Not the normality, but a good. And, uh, uh, the public uh, appreciated the mix between uh, the presence and uh, the, the streaming. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a point of no return for our organization. Is, that's a good point because my next question was going to be about mm -hmm. essentially, you know, has hopefully we are coming to a, 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 a real, you know, we, 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 we have to learn to way, a way of living with COVID. It's not going to go away. There will always be some form of COVID, like there have been other diseases. Um, uh, but clearly, things have changed. Do you, will you be going back to the, you know, the old ways of working 
2019? Or have your, has your business, business model changed in a really fundamental way so that even if COVID did end tomorrow, <laughs> you'd be doing things differently? So it, it, will, will you, if, if COVID ended tomorrow, would you go back to the old ways of working? Or would you take the new things you've learned and develop in a new way? I think that every one of us has to, to learn from what has happened. And you know, uh, I think that what will uh, essentially uh, will be and will remain the same, as I told before, is the heart of the festival, all that magical atmosphere, uh, people going around. But what um, we have learned is that we can do um, a lot of things also in a different way. I mean, we learned to have meetings on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Italians <laughs> like to meet, like to, to chat. It's characteristic of Italian people and uh, a beautiful characteristic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that a lot of times uh, we could also avoid because there are situations in which uh, meeting each other is fundamental. But there are a lot of other uh, meetings that we can really do uh, by Zoom, uh, by, and this is also linked to the sustainability point that we were uh, talking about before, because you know, um, no train, no cars, no planes. It's important. We, I think that we, we really could uh, avoid a lot of things, uh, thinking also to the, 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 the welfare of, uh, of our world, because um, COVID has, has um, teach us that nothing remains the same. And everything we, we can do, everything we um, will be able to do is important, really. Mm not just Zoom, but a lot of things, you know. Um, in, uh, during Jazz in August, uh, those uh, four wonderful but difficult days, uh, we weren't able to have uh, international artists in, uh, in Perugia because of, of the problems that uh, there were among the different countries. So uh, the festival uh, was made only uh, by Italian artists. And I'm not saying that uh, the future will be, because you know, music is international. M music is a change of opinions, of mood, of uh, a lot of things. But um, what I, I want to say that I think that um, regarding uh, um, everyone's uh, territory, I think that uh, um, we um, we should really um, give much more importance, you know, to territory products, to um, companies of the territory, because we can do everything. We we, we, we can uh, call uh, uh, people and from uh, all around the world, but I think it's also uh, a, a, um, something uh, that uh, um, people coming from abroad could appreciate because if they come to the festival, I, I'm, I'm speaking of this uh, naturally now, uh, they come for the music, but they also come because they, the festival, is held in a beautiful uh, region. And so they can appreciate going to museums, uh, uh, tasting Italian food, uh, buying uh, a t-shirt that has been made by biological culture in this region. Um, I think we uh, have to, to begin to link all the things. What is uh, good from abroad, but also to revitalize what it is good in this territory because everyone, everything is linked, absolutely. This is my opinion, but. 
<laughs> Andrew Daniel? Um, I, I think the, the, the aim is uh, how to transit from emergency measures to structural mm -hmm. procedures. So for instance, uh, in uh, Umbria Libri, we never uh, had reservation or booking for the event. Uh, and that was a, a, a way not to monitor our public, uh, not to check uh, the capacity of, uh, of the room. So you have, maybe you have uh, one event of, for three people uh, and another with uh, uh, many of them uh, in, uh, out of the out of the door so for instance this is the this could be a, a normal new normal procedure mm -hmm. how to book uh, not uh, in a uh, heavy mm -hmm. hard way but uh, as a measure of uh, um, check mm -hmm. and also to know better uh, our public uh, because this is the um, a way to uh, introduce uh, new uh, new things, uh, new efforts, new authors, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, to match better with events, uh, audience, uh, and also uh, organization measures. So this is uh, a thing that we, after the all the other that we can learn. So you're building a, a database of of customers, essentially. Yes. And um, also the social network and the use of social network mm -hmm. uh, that was increased uh, in uh, 2020 and 2021 because uh, of the new uh, new way to uh, interact mm -hmm. in, in the festival or in, in, in all this situation of a cultural situation also through the use of the social network we uh, can have uh, um, our customers uh, more involved more involved and more uh, um, um, yes, the engaged with engaged yeah. yes thank you yeah. engaged with the manifestation not only during the event but uh, uh, afterwards. afterwards and during the interview yeah. the whole year good yeah. okay um right i think we're going to go to the international side of things thank, thank you very you. much uh, to you, both Andrew. of you and we'll call you back up later on for the last question okay, okay but thank, thank you, you very much to both of you for for joining me here and uh we are going to go bring in our international guests now um so uh, if i can call the three people up anna and patricia and inez if you'd like to come and join me here on stage and i um So, um, we, and we also should hopefully have um, Catalina on the screen as well. So I'm going to introduce uh, um, our guests. On my left here, we have Anna Paraskiv uh, from Northeast Region Development Agency in Romania. On my immediate right, we've got Patricia Mora from Extremadura in Spain. Uh, my far right is uh, Inez Saditz from Šibenik in Croatia. And then on the screen, uh, we're joined by one of the people, if you're going to wave, uh, is Katalin Dudash. Yes, there we go, waving. Oh, I can see you here as well, so I don't need to turn around, you're there. Um, from uh, Panon EGTC in Pesh in Hungary. Um, so these are our, our panelists. We're going to do a conversation between the three of us, um, uh, Patricia, Katalin, and Inez and then Anna is going to do a presentation at the end on the same sort of topics. Um, but I wanted to kick, kick it off really with just a bit about what Hay Festival, with my, with my other hat on, uh, Sustainability Director of Hay, and what we did. Uh, and it, it's a lot of there's some many parallels between what we've already heard uh, from Umbria in the, in, in the way the pandemic hit. We were, um, our 
Hay Festival, we, we run festivals all over the world. We, uh, our main festival is in Hay on Wye, just in, on the border of Wales and England. Um, and that normally takes place in May. Um, and then we run them in, in Colombia and Spain and Peru and Mexico. Um, so uh, we, uh, the, when, when the pandemic first sort of hit the UK, which was slightly after the, uh, in Italy, but not much after, um, uh, we were in the middle of planning our main festival, um, which takes place 11 days at the end of May. Uh, and normally that's 750 events, about 900 different artists, uh, approximately 200,000 ticket sales, all live. We record most of it, but it's mostly a live festival. Um, and uh, we found out that we were going to be locked down uh, with about eight weeks before the festival was due to take place. So it was a bit of a like a, a bit like most people's like, oh my God, how the hell and what the hell are we going to do? And we were very much the same as, as you, Claudia, which is we need to do something. We can't just stop. You know, there isn't, the, the, the music has to carry on, the art has to ca carry on, the, the conversations must take place. But clearly they couldn't take place in the same way. So uh, we very quickly pivoted uh, and went purely online. Um, so we, we, we in, I think it took, it took us around six weeks to turn we dropped most of the events and kept the ones we felt would be the most um, interesting to an international audience. Um, and uh, we uh, basically went fully digital um, uh, and we ran, I think it was 104 events over the 11 days and 700, all, all online. Uh, um, but what was interesting was we were in full lockdown when we ran, ran the event. So the, I mean, we were doing it from, we were all working from home and most of our customers were on home, but were, were at home as well. Um, and uh, we, we went for, we had, uh, I think it was 550,000 event registrations uh, with people watching from 140 countries from around the world. Um, and uh, it was, uh, we were lucky in some ways because we were the first major festival in the UK to go digital. We were in lockdown. It was still quite new. Zoom was, still something which people went oh zoom mm. rather than oh, zoom mm. so it was still a, it was a very much we were we were lucky and people were desperate for content people were desperate to, to see and hear something different um so it, it was very successful and what was interesting is we actually got um a, a 50 percent of the audience of those 550,000 people were entirely new to us we didn't they'd never had any engagement with us before they weren't on any of our records from any of our any of our festivals from any of our countries so that that was a really interesting way of of, of, of gaining a 50 percent new audience which we wouldn't have had and we decided quite early on that we would we normally charge for all of our events it's normally every, every event is ticketed um and and, and costed and we, we decided to go free. We, we said, actually, we'll make, we will make this free and go for a donation model and ask for donations from people um, uh, uh, as, as a way of, of trying to cover and recover some of the costs, um, which was reasonably successful. It was more successful than we thought it would be. We had about, eight, about eight, eight and a half thousand donations from those, um, it's approximately probably 200,000 people, individuals, um, so not very many people actually donated. A lot of people watched it for free. Mm -hmm. That's the risk. But what was interesting, the people who did donate, donated substantial amounts. So they actually valued it. So most people were donating roughly the equivalent of what they would have done if they come and bought tickets for, for a live event. So that was, and it was echoing what you were saying, Claudia, about the, that there was a, there was a, there was a, a general feeling that we need, still need to support these events. We can't just, if we were willing to pay for it beforehand, then we should be willing to pay for it now. Um, so that, that was very interesting um, and, uh, and helped us with, with surviving for that first festival. And then over the, the next sort of two years, we, we ran basically 12 digital festivals over those two years. Each, in each of the countries, we went fully digital. Um, uh, and they were all uh, successful in terms of reaching audience. Um, uh, but what I think what was what was interesting is how how it evolved over those two years, and much the same as you can't if you're doing a live festival you can't just keep doing the same thing every single year because people just get a bit bored of it. We found that we had to keep evolving what we were doing digitally. 
So the first one was very much, it was just uh, two people, like, like a Zoom conversation. But by the, by the following year, people were a bit fed up of Zoom. It was like, this was normal. So then we sort of, well, let's do it. Let's, let's create a studio and try and get, the pe get at least the authors to come to a studio, even if it wasn't, um, you couldn't have an audience. So changing the format and trying to make it more professional, make it more like more of a TV screen rather than a, rather than a, um, just a Zoom conversation. So that was part of it, was, was developing it over, over those years, of the two years. Um, but we also did see audience drop off. So, so by the following year, we were down to about 302,000 event views uh, over the 11 days of the festival, because we were fully digital again in, in 2021 in May, um, and down to about 135 countries rather than 140. So we were seeing shrinkage, but that's because I think people had more options. The first time there was no option. This is what you, you know, we were in full lockdown. By, by the following year, people had changed. Yeah. You know, people had experienced, it was a bit more open, there was much more choice. Um, so that was reflected in that. Um, so that, that's, I, I'll come on to some of the sustainability angles later on when we, when we take the final question. Um, but um, the, the other thing I think which was interesting in terms of audiences was that um, what, We've always recorded our events and we have them online on something called the Hay Player, where they, they stay online permanently and you can register and subscribe uh, to, to watch them uh, over, at any time over the years. And it's a really useful and really you know, um, uh, powerful resource. We, I think we have, we have over 9,000 recorded events on that space. Um, but what, what, what was interesting was the, the live events being... Um, both screened and also uh, with the text type underneath, mm. was that it opened up those live events to an audience which could never come to a live event, whether that was because of disability mm. or whether it was financial or whether it was location. By, ha by putting them out online, you actually access and open up your events to audiences who you'd never normally reach. And by having it all uh, subtitled, it meant that people who are, who, who are hard of hearing or deaf can actually read it and take part. And, and we, we've seen a big push from people saying, please, 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 can we keep this element? Because all of us, you know, we've always wanted to come to Hay, but we never could because of all those three reasons. And all of a sudden you have created this new audience. It also means you've created a new expectation and a new cost because it is not cheap to do all that. But there, it's, there's an opportunity there, I think, which, which COVID has, 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 has shown that uh, of developing new audiences. So that, that's a little bit about, about, uh, about Hay, just as we kick off the international angle. Um, Patricia, I want to come to you first. I mean, you've, you've heard the responses from Umbria mm -hmm. um, and a bit about what we've been doing. How did, when, when sort of the COVID first hit into Spain, what was, what was the reactions within the sort of cultural industry and the events industry specifically? Um, was it similar or did you find, you know, some, some major differences? Um. Well, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> answer that, but that's, um, uh, you've been talking about festivals mainly and um, also different kind of festivals. You know, music is something mm -hmm. you or something else. Libri is something different. Uh, the audience is different. Uh, the atmosphere is different. So uh, it was the same over there. Obviously, it was a shock. And uh, we also had the, in our area, we have the uh, peculiarity of not having, let's say, a huge touristic uh, uh, attractions like beaches. and uh, But we do have uh, cultural uh, tourism is, is one of the, the, let's say, the main uh, issues in our area. So for us, it was a um, lockdown was definitely terrible and uh, a great hit. It was a shock. Uh, we came down, I think, in the whole of the, the first year, 70% um, visitors. So we really had a, a shock there. Then uh, I think it also took a long time to actually um, start opening again. That was not easy because not only of the, all the uh, safety uh, measures and everything, but also uh, even the, the people working in the different institutions. If you think about uh, not only festivals, but also the um museums and uh, um all these heritage uh, sites uh, they had to start uh, the, the 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 people were afraid even the people you know the people working there so all these the, all these um questions were not uh, let's see let's say in 
the counting costs, mm -hmm. but they were there. So it took a, a little even more time, maybe with a little barrier to actually reopen in a proper way. Um, and then we had uh, also the, the problem of, a, well, it's not a, um, let's say a, a problem only in Spain, but in Spain we do have uh, different regions with different administrations, mm -hmm. uh, which make it even more complicated to actually know what the rules are yeah how you travel from one place to the other. So even, uh, I mean, obviously international um, uh, visitors were put down to a very, very low, but uh, even local, let's say, uh, national visitors were, were put down because of these kind of uh, restrictions within the country. And uh, maybe not even only restrictions, but also the, the, the flow of information, how, how the information of what, what you could do, what you couldn't do, trust and what was happening in another region, which you don't have all the information about. It's just a lot of, let's say, intangible yeah, yeah. Um, barriers mm -hmm. that are uh, added. No? So yes, uh, all kinds of creative uh, solutions have been uh, developed. Uh, there's been a huge, uh, I think uh, it, has, it has been a kind of, uh, reflection time, people have had to uh, react to the situation in all kinds of circumstances. It has been very, very hard, especially for the professionals, the people uh, Claudia was talking about, everybody who's behind mm -hmm. uh, all the mechanisms. No, uh, But on the other hand, it has brought things for us at least that uh, have been, I think, quite positive in the sense that uh, uh, there's another kind of uh, visit, um, visiting. There's people who are uh, organizing uh, beforehand is something which is not is, is happening now that uh, wasn't maybe happening so much so you can actually foresee who's coming and you can prepare uh, on the other hand all these uh, this needs services so you you have to have people organizing guides and organizing visitors and so on uh, that's happening and we think that probably will stay let us say in some way as you were saying disabled people were in, uh, included in a huge way, especially in museums. Uh, contents of heritage information was also brought to a much higher level mm -hmm. because you could, we, we had to give a huge um, uh, boost to all the digital, uh, but then there were so many tools there that nobody knew about and suddenly appear. Uh, we have a very interesting experience with museums uh, over there um, adapting to uh, disabled uh, people and people with all kinds of different uh, disadvantages. And uh, I think definitely there has been a huge, uh, um, let's say, positive impact of, of COVID. Also sustainability issues, because you do have now the option to travel in a different way, to um, um, consume uh, culture and heritage in a different way. So it's there. Um, so um, yes, I think it, it has been a very similar, probably very similar experience to what has happened in Umbria, but we definitely in our area probably going to be, I would say in the, in the long term, it's going to be a positive effect because of the kind of landscape. And the, we have a very, um, uh, we have very uh, good weather and open air activities have been a huge uh, uh, demand people are thinking about trying to uh, enjoy nature and heritage at the same time and the same travel uh, and the same uh, visits. So all those kind of uh, the slow tourism, you know, the, the appreciation of what is going, trying to relax, mm -hmm. all that has come up as a, as a I would say a, a COVID uh, second uh, effect. Yeah. And in that case, we are there, you know, we're in a good, in a good position, I would say that's, that's more or less what uh, we perceive. Yeah, no, I think, I think it, it is that change of, of perception. We've all had that time to, mm. we have more time to actually, we've had to stop, we've had mm. to slow down. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's, if we're, clearly there's, there's a desire to a certain extent to have some of the return to some of the things we used to, which were faster. Mm. But I think if we can retain some of that, it will obviously help with this more sustainable approach to both tourism and also general living. And it's quite interesting what I, I, would, I was just thinking when you were talking about the, um, the, the confusion over the difference in regulations and rules between different regions. And we have the same in the UK with, well, not just between England. So Hay is on the, right on the border of Wales and England. I live in England, one kilometer away from the festival in Wales. And we, I, we had two, at one point, 
we had almost completely open in England and Wales was almost completely locked down. It was, you know, and literally I couldn't throw a stone from one to the other. It, was, it just didn't, it, it didn't make any sense to a certain extent, but it also became confusing both for local people and also and any visitors. It just became very, very confusing. Um, thank you for that, Patricia. Can, I'm going to go to Catalina. Are you there? Yes. No, so are you there? I keep turning around. I don't know, it's Hello. 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 Um, uh, do you, I mean, did, does that chime with you? Did you, did, did, did you have a very similar experience um, in, in Hungary as well as what we've heard from both Spain and, um, and Italy? Exactly. So we had the, diff the very similar um, situation, but we, we, uh, we don't have that good weather than <laughs> in Spain. We're, we're the so, same. <laughs> but the first when, when uh, the COVID hit uh, the, the, the tourism and really in, in Hungary, that was 2020 in March. And it's uh, till June 2020, all the tourism, uh, tourist attraction and hotels were closed during this time. So we are in a uh, very, I am not the expert, but I um, uh, I uh, interviewed the part our partners, and uh, I got very good information uh, from the festival part and from the cultural her uh, heritage part. Uh, for example, um, how they survived <laughs> this situation. Uh, if we looking for the the festival side, uh, they uh, had to change all dates and they can't organize that year uh, many, many festivals. So they start to reorganize uh, these festivals and start to find the new dates. But that was very hard because uh, nobody knows what will happen in the next month or the, or the next day. Um, so from them was very, very hard. Uh, but in the another part, if we are looking, for example, the uh, cultural uh, heritage sites, for example, we have the uh, Jolnai culture, cultural uh, quarter. Uh, they was busy on the summertime. Why? Because it's all um, these attractions uh, you can see this is open and uh, uh, if you don't want you don't have to go in so you can just uh, look them um, uh, inside. So for, 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 uh, from their side uh, their, uh, their, um, so they were uh, busy. But the regulations had been changed many times. So usually the tourists had to wear mask inside, uh, inside the exhibition or inside the churches. So whatever, where they have to go. So, uh, but um, uh, till, uh, so that was uh, 2020, yes, in June, but they, uh, after June, everything was opened. And from 2020, 11 November, again, lockdown and, uh, and just the cultural quarter and everything, the festivals and everything just can open 2021, uh, 1st May. So, and from that day, uh, they, uh, they start to organize the events and, uh, but uh, they had to follow the regulations. But uh, I asked them, uh, the, did they have any problems with that? Because, uh, because uh, the, the regulation is always uh, changing. And they said that um, the problem was that uh, sometimes uh, the regulation was not clear. So it was not clear for the for the organizers and and after for the uh, the, the uh, tourists uh, just ask okay so what what I have to do and uh, in Hungary uh, 2021 uh, we got the vaccination card and for the festivals everybody has to use it so you just. Um, you can uh, attend on the event if you have that vaccination card, or sometimes it's depend on the regulation. You had sometimes on the very open area, you can go without vaccination card. But if you want to go in somewhere, you need your vaccination card. So that was a little bit uh, uh, tricky because uh, somebody has vaccination and they said, sorry, it's not, uh, the card is not with me. So that was 
no, it's hard for the organizer yet uh, because they can't um, allow them to come in. And so it's it's uh, that was a little bit uh, uh, hard, but um, but people uh, they they follow the, re the the regulations they 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 follow everything what the organizers uh, ask for example to wearing face mask and and to to use the hand sanitizer so whatever uh, they they had to do but um, uh, everybody um, so they um this the uh, the organized very good events uh, to uh, to 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 collect all uh, uh, regulation what they have to use for example they use the steam uh, the uh, disinfection for example so a lot of them uh, buying steam machines so to clean it for example uh, if some uh, groups uh, go in after four uh, free groups they uh, 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 how to say sterilized or how it is the rooms you know so and and a lot of these um, um, a lot of these um, this kind of um, how to say it? Um, they use it that they they want to to uh, have more and more programs, and they they want to to allow for more and more people to come in uh, for more safe. Uh, uh, and um, I think uh, because I uh, collect this information from the from the festival part from the the journalistic. Um, uh, from the uh, journey part and from um, one um, room theater part that the the hardest thing was uh, when they was closed and uh, from some part they didn't have enough money uh, to um, to pay for example the salaries so some uh, so they have to um, they have to uh, change in, uh, uh, for example people's uh, work so they uh, they move them on another place so but they they uh, uh, always uh, uh, find some good um, good way how how they can add work for that people who are in this uh, um, in this uh, in, in the tourism so, but we have some uh, good things, for example, um, that uh, now if they organize some events, um, they start to, uh, to, to, or not just for the events, for the attractions too, that they uh, have, you know, you have to ask the appointment if you want to go and from that part that way they can um, uh, they can um, they can allow more and more people to go to the churches and and uh, and this is uh, it's better than before because when it's busy time for example summer then is many people in these uh, indoor rooms so from today it's uh, you have to you have to have your appointment for example and and then you can use these um, uh, attractions more safety than before so that's it in very short <laughs> thank you so so you you also went to a more and i think it's quite interesting how um this has been the same for for several people now saying that you've gone to more of a a, a registration approach to to managing to managing yeah. the events um, yeah I, I think it will be it will be interesting to see how 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 we can well, whether that does keep is, is maintained i guess it will depend on how useful it is um going forward and how and, and how we sort of try and uh, integrate that into into a into a more when we become freer in terms of our um our, our um, access um thank you for that um thank you. um and clearly we've, we've heard a lot about the, the different um festivals and events and, and cultural heritage um and uh, in croatia was was it similar i mean it, or, or is there anything that stands out to say actually it was nothing like that in croatia or was it 
pretty much the same. But it was pretty much the same. Um, as the uh, colleagues and the partners say, the first phase of the uh, very beginning of the pandemic caused um, a huge negative impact mm -hmm. to for everyone. And uh, we, has, we have to start thinking in a different ways. We have to start reorganize, reorganize the work and um, how to make uh, changes, what we can do now. We, then we know that we don't have the number of the events, what we plan for this year and what we can do now. Something what we can change in a virtual way, like, uh, I don't know, we organized a virtual exhibition, uh, a night of museum was not uh, physically, it was virtuality, we changed. But we then, uh, when the, when the, uh, when the COVID pass and the uh, green pass uh, vaccination card uh, uh, started to organize the co with the events with the COVID pass, and then we uh, also the people was not a bit was a bit annoyed about that. They uh, don't like this, and then we then the changes and the decisions on the local level and the national level are changed a few times, and uh, in the one in the one point. Uh, nobody uh, doesn't know what to do what is the correctly what we can what we can now uh, the open spaces are mostly can be without covid pass but some some organizations use the restrictions and they are uh, one that uh, want the green pass and for mostly uh, the spaces when you are go, going under under there is covid pass so mostly similar like the in the other countries, mostly similar in Croatia. And do you, other things in Croatia, we, um, which you have undertaken as part of the COVID response, which you will, you think this will definitely stay. This is a change yes. to the way we do things. And this will be, it's a change for the good. Have you got any examples of what you think this is definitely going to be a different way of working? Yes, I think that positive uh, changes, it's uh, in a way of sustainability and the environment. You know, when you reduce the number of visitors, when you reduce the, the garbage, the zero mm -hmm. waste, and, um, you know, that examples, that is in positive way what I can say. But yeah. is, that, is that sustainable in terms of a financial model? Because clearly, if you've got less visitors, then potentially you're going to have less income. Mm -hmm. Is that maybe we have a uh, maybe we have okay. reducing number of visitors? It's not in, in financial way. It's also low uh, low financial uh, low financial uh, <laughs> income. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that we're in this. You know, we're in the creative industry events and cultural heritage is a creative industry so it shouldn't be surprised that we've creatively found ways of dealing with the pandemic um and i think we have when you look at the creative industry in general the responses have been phenomenal it doesn't matter whether it's in events or festivals or art or drama or whatever there have been some amazing responses um anna um would you like to do your uh, your response to the, the questions um and tell us what's happened in uh, romania Will, uh, present um, uh, our situation in in Romania. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the situation is uh, quite the same with uh, another country. Um, uh, there is a particularity in Romania um, in terms of uh, beginning of the wave number five. Uh, this wave uh, uh, began later than uh, the other countries. And uh, for this reason, uh, the um, uh, green certificate uh, has introduced uh, later than uh, the other countries. And uh, now I'm going to, to tell you about the um, uh, Romanian experience or uh, organize, organization uh, COVID safe cultural events. And I refer about the Med Medieval Stories Festival at the Suchava Princely Fortress between uh, 13 and 15 August 2021. 
uh, as I said uh, in the morning session, the measure to prevent uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus infection uh, in all um, in uh, cultural heritage in Romania uh, were, um, were following. Um, visiting the public is allowed inside only if the mask uh, is worn. Uh, the access to the cultural objectives is made with um, uh, observance by the participants of the distance of at least one and a half uh, a meter between people. Vis visitors will uh, disinfect their hands. Visitors will use the shoe the sanitizer uh, mats at the entrance. Access for persons with symptoms of respiratory infection uh, is not uh, permitted. The public will follow uh, the one-way visit flows. Access is allowed in groups of uh, up to uh, three people, except the four families with the two or more children. Uh, inside space can be at the same time uh, maximum uh, 30 people. Uh, access to new visitors is allowed gradually and uh, uh, gradually as people who have uh, visited uh, have left the museum. Uh, no specialized guidance were provided. The visit was limited to a maximum of uh, 60 minutes. After the first uh, four hours from the start of the visit, the inside was uh, closed for 30 minutes for disinfection operations. Uh, regarding the activities for the public at the Medieval Stories Festival between 13 uh, and 15 August 2021, the audi uh, audience was able to enjoy of medieval shows and demonstration stunts fire shows, children's shows, as well as a concert. Uh, hygiene me measure and uh, uh, physical uh, distance uh, were the same uh, at this time. Only um, uh, 83 guests at the festival members of the medieval troops, given that in the previous uh, edition, their number exceeded uh, 500. The, vis the invited troops were organized in workshops to comply with the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. Uh, at the, uh, this year, the 2021 years, uh, was, uh, was a record number of visitors, uh, almost uh, um, 23,000 uh, uh, exceeding 2018. And um, 20, uh, 23rd uh, thousand tickets were sold. Um, the comments of the event organizer, organizers uh, was, uh, medieval stories in the Suchava princely fortress recorded a record number of visitors. We regret that we were not able to organize the, uh, me the medieval parade this year, but the figures show that this year's festival was a real success among locals and tourists. And I want to thank the, audi the audience that uh, came in such a large members and for the fact that visitors followed the rules set by the organizers imposed uh, by this pandemic situation. We hope that next year this uh, festival will be able to organize in the conditions before the pandemic, said the representatives of the local authority. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope uh, the picture uh, were uh, mm -hmm. very, very <laughs> <laughs> representatives for uh, our uh... can i ask you a question anna if if um, there were more tickets sold than previously yes how did that how did that i mean was it busy beforehand or was it so i mean if, if you had social distancing measures and all the other things did that mean the event lasted long did you run the event for longer or how did it 
I'm slightly confused about how if you had you, have, you had all these things in place to reduce numbers and make sure everyone was safe, but then you had more people. Yes. How did that? How did you work that? Um, uh, the the festival uh, were uh, organized uh, for a few days. They um, entrance uh, in groups, and um, uh, I I uh, think that um, the people um, uh, were uh, the desire to meet each other uh, was uh, very very high, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, uh, because tw uh, the 2020 was uh, broke. Right. Okay. And it's interesting you chose the medieval stories since there were lots of plagues during medieval time as well. So <laughs> it was very apt, very apt. Um, uh, thank you, Anna, thank for you. that. Um, so um, I just want to uh, call up the uh, two previous um, uh, uh, guests, Claudia and um, uh, Antonella. Um, and we didn't, no, wait, don't go anywhere. <laughs> God. <laughs> You haven't finished. No, uh, no, up, up, up. Right. So this is this we have now. So we have a. This is the final question for the whole panel, in, including you, Catalan, if you're still there as well. Um, I hope you're still there. So um, essentially, we, we are. Um, yeah, and you, Anna, come on. Uh, um, so one things which we were. Um, someone's phone is going. That's oh, mine. <laughs> um, so. Um, the, the future for for events um it, it was interesting it, we, we, we've touched on sustainability and i think one of the things which um uh, pre prior to this pandemic there was a the, the, there's there was a there was a uh, a suggestion whether well, the overriding feeling was that you couldn't make big change i'm talking about sustainability now you couldn't change society quickly and what the pandemic definitely showed was <laughs> almost overnight we can completely change society. So one of the big, I think one of the big takeaways from all this, from a sustainability perspective, is that change is possible. You can, we can make massive changes to society and people will you know, follow rules and change it if they are convinced of the need of it. Um, but I think the other thing on sustainability, on sustainability angle is that um, I, I remember my now former chief exec saying to me when we went to digital, Oh, brilliant. We're going to be carbon neutral for this festival. I, I wait a minute. Well, wait a minute. We're not. Because digital, and this is, this is something which has become a bit of a passion of mine over the last two years because we haven't done all the other bits on sustainability. But obviously, digital technology has its own impacts. You know, three, I think 3.7% of all global emissions are because of global technology. The, and, and the biggest part of all, all of te digital technology is streaming, streaming videos, streaming events, streaming this. It, it's, it's the biggest, it's the biggest impact. I think it was uh, three, uh, 300 in 2018 streaming was 380 million tons of CO2 produced. So there's, it, it isn't, it isn't just a carbon neutral aspect. It has an impact. And I think, but what it does do also is make changes. And what we can do also is still, we can, we can make, sustainable digital choices as well. So when uh, my final question to all of you and Kathleen, I think you're still there, although I can't see you anymore, um, is, um, and this is a quick one line, okay? No long answers, quick one line. Um, what do you see as the future for, and we'll focus on the events and festivals going forward. Are we going, uh, what's, the bit, what's the main change that you think positive change for the future, thinking about sustainability and thinking about post-COVID, one major, one major positive thing which is going to come forward, which you think you will be taking forward in your events or your area for the future, and I'm going to go to Claudia first. So, uh, the first thing that I would like to say is that uh, uh, Umbria Jazz Festival uh, had begun. Uh, its proper path uh, towards uh, sustainability a lot of years uh, before. Um, the important thing is that during the um, pandemic period, uh, in which we really uh, had uh, much more times 
to think about a lot of things that uh, it could be possible to do, uh, we decide uh, to um, to make this sort of examination uh, with a society that is part of Lega Ambiente, that is an, an important um, company uh, which uh, um, is about, uh, you know, sustainability and um, everything uh, regarding it. And we did this examination and we received, we, we were the first uh, uh, festival in Italy to receive uh, two green leaf, the maximum is three. And we discover uh, that a lot of things that are uh, related to, sust uh, to sustainability, we already did. Uh, we did not want to stop. Uh, we did a lot of things. We uh, we have, we make agreement with the, um, the company responsible for garbage collection. You know to do um, a different uh, wasted collection. But we also made some tutors in the area of the festival to show people how to differentiate in, uh, differentiate in the in the in the proper way. We, we put uh, free uh, um, water house to uh, uh, water uh, free, not buying, uh, you know, plastic bottles. Uh, we use green energy. Uh, we make an agreement uh, uh, with the, the, um, the company that um, is responsible for all our uh, food uh, areas to use at least a certain part of uh, food of the territory. You know, uh, we already did, did it, but the period of pandemic uh, gave us time to do much more. And once the way has been, you know, uh, opened, I think that we have to, to, come to, to go on and make, make all this better. Great, okay. So one major, example of what you're going to take forward in as your next one, one just zero waste as well so zero waste even. okay that's the future patricia um i'm not so positive okay no nope. that's fine you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to be positive so that i i i'm afraid festivals um are about gathering mm -hmm. i do think we have the tools but i do think it's going to have to be the will of organizers and people that make it uh, a sustainable event because um, we're going to have a transition to energy, yep. which is going to be in clean energy. Well, maybe you in the UK not, but we're having it in Europe. Uh, so that's going to happen. There is more. We know not more. We can change. We've, we've seen that. But uh, I think if we're not careful, we can go just to add yep. online to what's happening yep. physically. Yep. So um, I think it has to be, um, we have to be aware and we have to be on, on it and we have to want it. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I'm sorry, I, I think it's there. You're, you're right that we, we've shown that it can happen, that the tools are there. Investments have also been done, which would, yeah. if, it, if it wasn't because of COVID, maybe we never would have done, but uh, it's still going to have to be, a, I would say, a, a matter of choice, yeah. really. It's not, I, I appreciate I'm asking a very simple, for a simple answer to a very complex okay. question. It's, okay, it's not, just... it's not simple. If it was simple, we'd have done it, but oh. there are some issues. So, but oh. thank you, Patricia. Anna. Uh, in my opinion, I uh, think that digitalization, the hybrid m way to organizing uh, the festivals and also the events will remain uh, the good point okay. for uh, now on. Good. Thank you. Antonella. I prefer not to respond, to, to answer <laughs> about uh, festival or about Umbria Libre, but uh, I, um, I prefer to focus now on my other chat. Yep. Uh, those for museums and mm -hmm. heritage. Uh, and uh, the pandemic also affected this. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, sure. I appreciated the, the colleague from Extremadura with the, the vision about yeah. it. So the, the answer could be uh, go locally. We, we have uh, we have learned to, to focus more on uh, local public uh, to engage uh, the school uh, with uh, uh, the, the, our <laughs> uh, learning in, on distance. And uh, if we change uh, something more uh, sustainable and uh, environmental uh, friendly, 
is uh, go local, act with local, act with our public, zero kilometers, mm -hmm. uh, also, and not only follow the international tourism. Yeah. So this could be a, a little thing, but a very important thing for increasing audience and to be more uh, um, um, near. Rooted, to our rooted in your... Rooted, yeah. yeah. Thank okay, you. great. And uh, last but not least, Catalin. Yes, so I agree. So we have to involve the local people and we start to involve last uh, summer the local people and it works, so it's good. People are coming, people don't want to go very far, so they want to be on the same place one or maximum two days and they are going home. But my my last sentence that we have to be uh, better prepared for the sustainability. And if we are um, thinking about the festivals, the organizers have to be more flexible because every day or every month something is happen. So they have to be more flexible. That's it, very short. More flexible. No, and, and I think they have shown themselves to be, certainly from my experience, the flexibility and creativity of, of, of people in the creative industries, whether that's museums or whether <laughs> it's festivals, has been phenomenal. Right, um, we're going to go now to our last speaker, Dr. Hai Huin, who's a senior lecturer at the Department of Marketing, Events and Tourism at the University of Greenwich, and she's going to talk about observations uh, on uh, tourism and events. Hi, hi. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, that's the sentence that I hear a lot. Hello, hi, hi. Yeah, that's <laughs> sorry, that's sorry. very. Um, I'm I'm proud of my name actually. So that's great. I'm um, sorry that I don't have um, fun story, exciting story to tell, and so I'm sharing my slides with some information. And um, we have been hearing quite a lot of information from organizers. So I would trying to actually share from the other perspective, which is from the consumers, from the attendees, from the visitors, from the tourist perspective. Um, so I'm going to actually um, uh, providing some information to, uh, or kind of findings of the research in the last two years about the behavioral change due to COVID-19 in the tourism and event sectors. Um, so I would trying to keep this presentation in about 10, 15 minutes um, so that um, you can save some time for your dinner um but yeah i just go ahead and and actually started with um with information on the the changes that have been found in uh, the research in mostly academic but also consultancy research in the last two years um and there's a lot of change that you have been talking in the last um, two hours or so, um, but I just want to briefly just mention it again to, related to demand, of course, we have less of them. Um, however, um, it's very interesting that our, um, because probably Kiara have been talking about our, our, our survey and from the pilot study, we actually found that why the, um, the demand for traveling regionally and nationally doesn't um, actually decrease the demand for going to heritage site to go into either indoor or outdoor as well as, and um, events or attending events and festival actually decrease a lot so people tend to ch still go out for leisure but they choose other type of activity rather than um, culture heritage site and festival so that, that might not be uh, good news but i will get to the good news uh, later on and then we do have other changes that possibly um, many of us have been observed and have been actually found from personal experience or from hearing from others, such as um, the preferences for um, the, the place that we visit or the types of events that we, we um, attend. So more outdoor thing, more um, like kind of rural place and um, the places also with the lower infection rate also those are the ones that are more preferable um, than than others and then um, the duration of trip is shorter um, and people have less money to spend um, but that's not true that all people have less money to spend and that point i will come back a little bit later 
business travels has been postponing um, not really uh, cancel or, or um, but has to postpone um, and as we see now here many of us cannot really attend there in beautiful Italy we have to stay home wherever we are and, and that is is also another change um, that I want to mention about the uh, the digital but we'll come back to that later on. Um, the use of public transport has been decreased because um, people prefer to have or their uh, private vehicles so they feel safer. However, this is not really true for some country, especially developing countries, whose um, the, the residents are dependent on the public transportation. Um, so it's, it's, it's very careful on, on saying where and who um, have decrease in terms of the use of transportation. And um, I actually want to draw our attention to the last four points. Um, and the partners or the speakers, the previous speaker have been mentioned this before, and that is stay local. Um, it's very important that people now prefer to, to be within their um, uh, local area. And the pandemic actually helped a lot of people discover the local um, um, atmosphere, the local habitat and the local places and, and just their neighborhood in general. And this is actually a very positive thing. And I know that some of, uh, of our colleagues there have been uh, successfully engaged with local people. And, and that is a very, very positive point. Another positive point for um, events is that the pandemic actually quite heavy on people's mental health and arts and culture uh, the area that are found to be really, really helpful for mental health, and therefore people also crave for uh, more arts and, and cultural engagement. And, and these give opportunities for local arts and culture festivals and events, um, like we all have said here. So this is a very positive um, future or really good news for the future of arts and culture festivals, especially um, organizing for local residents. Um, the third point that I want to, to stress on, um, we also talk uh, quite heavily in the last two hours, that's the use of digital enhancements in um, events and festivals. And a lot of people have found that, well, from organizer perspective, um, you found that this is very effective way of organizing events. From the consumer, from the visitors, attendees perspective, the pandemic actually forced them to be to willing to use these digital enhancement or tools, and they are now more open to the digital and virtual enhancement. And especially you can see um, recently with the announcement of metaverse and so on, you know, the, the virtual um, uh, environment starting to be to become uh, not a kind of the things that we use as an alternative to, to, to the live event as well, but somewhat to enhance the, the, um, the experience. So this is what people are also accepting and people somehow, especially younger group, are looking forward to. Um, and the last one that um, might not have been mentioned a lot, uh, but it's also important, that is the, the emotional side of um, the, the consumer experience or the, the attendees and visitor experience. This is a very important one because now people travel, people attending event and festival with a mixed feelings or mixed emotion. It's not just about excitement. It's not just about um, fun and happiness. People also feel a little bit anxious. People um, a little bit feel um, kind of skeptical and worried about um, their safety and, and their, their family safety as well. So this is the, the kind of a negative side of emotion that um, appeared a lot in um, the academic research. And a lot of people have been worried when they travel, even before travel and before attending festivals and, and events, this influenced their decisions either to to attend or not um, and also their decision to travel of course so this emotion or the negative emotion or mixed emotion is the point that is very important uh, point to, to notice however i want to to also stress that all of these changes are not the same across different groups of uh, people um, they vary by age gender 
um, family size, household income, all of the demographic features um, kind of have a different impact on, 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 on these chains. For example, one of our research um, we conduct here at University of Greenwich. So um, uh, Professor Coca Stefania and myself and other team member um, have found that in the context of, of China, um, the um, kind of the, this family size, the smaller family size, are not actually affected much by the the pandemic so they still have the, uh, the the same kind of budget they still can travel um and the people who have a higher level of education high income they're also not affected their budget do not reduce uh, they still travel a lot and i think i remember one of the speaker before saying that people have the desire to travel and therefore um when they're allowed to when they feel safe to do so they really do it so it's not that they would decrease the 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 demand is actually kind of saved somewhere in the pocket there and when it's time they will spend all of that money and 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 the budget so this is actually also a good news but we have to be conscious when think about um the different changes is it's not the same across different um uh, countries even nationalities and different, different sectors different groups of population. Um, another result from our research um, is that the intention actually do not lead to the actual behavior. This is um, this is not new. Um, the gap between intentions and behaviors is always there. Um, you plan to do something, but at the end of the day, you're not 100% sure that you will do it. Um, however, because of the uncertainty, because of the pandemic, the rules, the regulations, safety measures, and so on, so many circumstances that changed uh, and, and without your um, kind of knowledge and even um, with your, you being able to predict it. So therefore, the intention is not actually an accurate prediction of the actual behavior so it's, it's really it's actually hard from the organizer perspective it's really hard to um to to actually plan because although you see that people are planned to to do it the uncertainty because of the rules and regulation restrictions and so on and so forth um uh, are not really um a good addition or a good force to predict people actual um, behavior and therefore there are other things like desire to travel for example the crave to travel like travel craving the desire to travel are um, other kind of um, concept or other way that you can measure people willingness to to travel and um, uh, one more thing that um, we also found that people tend to adopt a lot of protective or avoidance behaviors when they travel if they decided to travel um, and and this is a very important point so for example you the use it's very simple um, protective behavior such as the use of hand sanitizer uh, wearing face masks and and so on and to the very kind of avoidant like avoid indoor avoid uh, international travel all of these uh, protective and avoidant behaviors are uh, adopted by the majority of of, of visitors. However, this point is actually not that clear. And therefore, um, in this project, the share project that we are doing now, we're trying to investigate what kind of protected behaviors that people are adopting during travel now, or be during COVID, and maybe in the future, their plan in the future. And then we also collect different um, demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, family size, income, and so on, um, to, to, to do a comparison. And it's also be interesting to do the comparison between different um, nationality or different a resident of different country as well and the final point related to these change and this is the result from a consultancy um, of research and it is actually said that um, the people the potential visitor or potential tourists they are um, their willingness to travel or their willingness to visit a destination um, is influenced by the public governance or more specifically their crisis management strategies so they actually monitor different country rules and regulation and the changes of their regulations the way they govern and especially the crisis strategies in order to actually decide where to go um, this is 
this is actually a good point, especially uh, many of you who sit there as are um, involving in, in, in governance or different government levels. So you can see that DMOs and different um, uh, destination marketing organizations can actually help into creating a better image and have um, um, kind of uh, encourage people to travel to your destination, even to your events and festival. So you do have a an impact and a role in encouraging people to decide to travel to to your place and um to conclude actually my talk um i just want to introduce our survey that has been going on currently we have six different languages um for for these surveys and um the, the majority of the information that i present in the last few minutes, uh, we will be um, using that to, to explore a little bit more because two years um, uh, academic research cannot really find out everything. So we found that, for example, the travel behavior during the pandemic, um, how about people travel craving uh, within the next the last few um, years and in the next one or two years, for example, and especially the protective and avoidance behaviors that people um, adopted during their travel in the last year and they will adopt in the next summer um, so those are the information that we try to obtain from this survey and i just want to spread out um, the survey amongst um, the attendees today as well if you can help us with um, uh, with this survey that would be great it's actually we'll have back to you and we will provide more information for a uh, different governments organizations and different uh, level of authorities and that is actually all of the information and i would like to um present today thank you so much for your attention thank you hi that was fascinating and uh and really important work um i think coming out of of of, uh, of the pandemic so thank you so much for presenting that um and yes i would encourage people who are watching or if you've got people you know to please take part in the survey uh, the more the data the more accurate it will be uh, thank you very much hi um that's uh, all we've got time for for this event and the, the sort of the panel. So I would like to to uh, thank all, all of our panelists: Patricia, Catalina, Anna, Inez. Uh, oh, who else we had? Um, Antonella and Claudia. Uh, oh, uh, that's it, isn't it? I think. And hi. Uh, hi. Yes. So uh, thank you all to all of them. If you have got any questions um for for any of the participants then if you go on the share website the share interreg your website and go on the contacts page there are all the emails from the various people who have been here today if you can't find the right email just send it to Giada, which is on the italy email um, and then she'll forward them on so um thank you uh, so much thank you to all of our people who've been taking part and uh, thank you i'm going to hand you back to Giada. no oh, thank you very much there's not much more to add to this this has been a really interesting panel and even for me and I've been the one who submitted some of the questionnaires. I, there was so much more today to take home and uh, think about. There would be, I mean, if we want to delve into the things that we that has been said, we could start another panel all over again, and there's no time for that. But I still think that this is uh, give us the, the the stimulus to go on to keep this conversation going. And as Vilopumbria, we're committed to do that. So we will uh, have uh, more with our own stakeholders and take back to other to the partners. And of course, we are available for any other activities that we want to do on this. Um, I think this is uh, uh, this has proved, uh, as you said, that, that creative industries, uh, they being creative in their approach, even to emergencies, can pave the way for other industries to follow. So that's really something to 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 think about for the future. And uh, yes, well, thank you all. Um, this has been really interesting, and I look forward to you know, continuing this with you all in the future. Thank you.